So first, we just like to give a few words about Cornell's sesquicentennial today, since this is an official sesquicentennial event. So this year, Cornell University is marking the 150th anniversary of our founding, our sesquicentennial year. Today, in fact, marks Charter Day, where we celebrate the date in 1865 when New York State leaders established our land-grant mission and this great university was born. The McKay Lecture is a prime opportunity to reflect on this past and to recognize the legacy of discoveries and innovations that distinguish the work of the Division of Nutritional Sciences, the College of Human Ecology, and the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Cornell University. Nutritional Sciences is a field where the university enjoys a very rich history. Professor Clive McKay was among the faculty members who made significant contributions to this field. So the Clive McKay Lectureship was established in 1985 through an endowment to Cornell University by his wife, uh, Jeanette McKay, who also authored Clive's biographical memoirs in 1994. McKay was a visionary scientist who truly embodied the essence of Cornell University. He was a world-class scientist who challenged the prevailing wisdom of his time regarding the relationships among food, early nutrition, and health. In doing so, he founded the field of caloric restriction and aging and accomplished this without ever speaking the words sirtuin, reversitrol, histones, or even stem cells. His classic paper published in 1934 in the Scientific Monthly, shown here, we don't have the slides, sorry, <laughs> demonstrated that rats subjected to caloric, to caloric restriction at weaning, or shortly thereafter, had slower rates of growth, yet extended lifespans of up to 50%, with many calorically restricted rats living more than 1,200 days. McKay also noted that calorically restricted rats were physiologically younger than control rats fed a standard diet. The area of nutrition and life extension continues to be among the most exciting and active areas of life science research today. In keeping with the Cornell spirit, McKay's contributions extended well outside the laboratory. He played a prominent role in the development of healthier rations during World War II, consulted with the New York, Depart with the New York State Department of Health for their feeding programs, and created the famous Cornell Bread Book with his wife, with recipes inspired by his longevity research. And so maybe rats can be used as a model for humans. <laughs> yeah. So now it's my pleasure to introduce, or to have Saurabh Mita introduce today's McKay Lectureship Speaker. Thank you, Thank you Patrick. Uh, it's uh, truly my honor and pleasure to be introducing Dr. Stephen Heimsfeld, Heimsfeld uh, who graduated in chemistry from Hunter College in New York City, he was a graduate student here with Dr. Don uh, Silversch uh, Silverschmidt and uh, before getting his MD at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Uh, he has served as a professor of medicine at Emory University before working at Merck as its global director for scientific affairs and now is at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center as its executive director. Uh, Dr. Stephen Heimsfeld, he has told me multiple times to keep this really, really short, so I'm only going to give you a brief uh, glimpse. Uh, he has been uh, one of the uh, leading weight loss and obesity researchers uh, in clinical nutrition and has paved the way for a number of breakthroughs, including the development of the lithogenic index and the discovery that CD scans could be used to analyze the relationship between obesity and liver disease and between body fat and skeletal muscle mass. He has authored more than uh, nearly 500 peer-reviewed scientific articles, six books, and more than 100 book chapters on obesity, anorexia, bulimia, malnutrition, pregnancy, body composition, and caloric expenditure. Uh, he has unique insights and into the challenges faced uh, in developing new weight loss treatments, which he's going to talk a little bit more about today. So I think he's a really fitting McKay lecturer, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be presenting uh, uh, the biographical memoirs of Clive McKay by okay. his wife, uh, okay. Dr. Stephen Himes. Thank, Thank you so much. Just get here. Photo taken. Keep a little fat for us. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you.
Thanks very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. The last time I spoke in this room, I was 21 years old. <laughs> I can't believe it. So uh, I, I had a very unique experience. Uh, I'm an academic, uh, I'm a physician, and I had a five-year part of my career that I went uh, into a drug company and worked in the deep bowels of the drug company and came out the other side, an academic again. And so I have a very unique perspective of having seen things and learned about drug development that I think might be of interest to you. And uh, we, we know obesity is a tremendous global problem and uh, pharmacologic means might be one way to solve that problem, but you'll see the complexity involved. And I, um, I think most of you know that obesity has been around for millennia. And uh, this is a several hundred year old uh, painting of an obese child. So obesity has always been known. And if you go back a hundred years, uh, people who are uh, morbidly obese today by millions uh, were f in freak shows and sideshows, and uh, you joined a carnival if you were obese. And the idea of obesity, say in the 1920s, uh, was that uh, you had a glandular disturbance, perhaps a thyroid disease, uh, that you had some slow metabolism, and that you couldn't eat very much, yet become obese, or that you had some neurotic condition or some uh, psychological disturbance that led you to be obese. But it was definitely considered a rare condition and one that had uh, discrete abnormalities and people were sidelined who were obese. And uh, let's see. So the, uh, what I'd like to present today is why is it so hard to develop weight loss drugs to treat these conditions? And I'm going to tr uh, trace through the, the history of obesity in general. I thought it might be interesting to some of you. And I'm going to use uh, some of that as a straw man for why drugs are important to develop. So you, you may find some of it interesting or even controversial. So uh, uh, one of the milestones in the field was in the uh, 1960s. Mickey Stunker, many of you whom you know, psychiatrist uh, at University of Pennsylvania, but prior to that, uh, at other institutions, was the pioneer in what's called a Midtown study, uh, the Midtown Manhattan study, in which he largely dispelled the idea that underlying psychological disturbances were the basis of obesity in people. Uh, up until that point, it was, as I mentioned, it was thought that you're neurotic or you had some other psychological disease that predisposed you to obesity. So this was the first big rush that it's not a psychological disturbance that causes obesity in people. And then another major one, and I'm picking my favorite milestones here, was that uh, the obese don't uh, overeat, that you become obese because you have a slow metabolism. And a number of ideas dispel that notion, but perhaps in my career, the most important one was Dale Schuller, who developed the doubly labeled water method. And, and for those of you who don't know, the doubly labeled water method, uh, you take a uh, drink out of this little cocktail glass of uh, deuterium and uh, oxygen 18 labeled water, which mixes with, of course, H2O. And you drink that in, in an hour or so that distributes in your total body water. And then uh, slowly, uh, over time, that deuterium disappears as water does, but O18 uh, disappears as water and as carbon dioxide in respiration. That oxygen in the CO2 gets labeled with the O18. And so the uh, O18 water disappears more rapidly. And that difference between deuterium and oxygen 18 from a urine sample 10 or 14 days later allows you to calculate the rate of CO2 production. And from that, the rate of energy expenditure of the body. And that work uh, was seminal because it showed that people who are obese eat more than people who are normal weight. And you eat you know, roughly in proportion to your body weight. So obese people who weigh more eat more than people who are normal weight. So it's a very important observation. 
uh, because it dispelled a lot of myths about obesity and it also led to the notion that uh, obesity and overeating are linked and that uh, uh, you could modify that through behavior. So really one of the pioneers in this area was uh, Richard Stewart and he wrote this uh, paper, Behavioral Control of Overeating, and developed this idea in the 1960s, actually right at the time I was standing here. And uh, he developed this idea that uh, uh, obesity is a result of uh, bad eating habits and you could identify those habits through behavioral mechanisms. And uh, Stewart's model uh, and others since then uh, were that you have an antecedent that is a stimulus of some kind. Go to a cocktail party, you have a drink, that's the stimulus. You have the behavior, you eat, and that there's a consequence or a reward. And this is the so-called uh, ABC model of behavioral management because uh, the cornerstone, as I'm sure you all know, is you keep a food record, you write down what you're eating, where you're eating, how much activity you're doing, and you identify these behaviors and you look for ways to modify them. And so that's the behavioral model. And actually, Stuart, I didn't know this till recently, was one of the pioneers of Weight Watchers. And he joined with the founder of Weight Watch and created some of the first uh, plans for the Weight Watchers programs. But this remains the cornerstone of weight control management today. Some variation of this, no matter how you do it in the internet or whatever, behavior modification is important and it's based on this idea that you're overweight because of bad habits and these habits can be changed. Now uh, if you go on a diet, a behavioral management diet, uh, this uh, is the Minnesota experiment and uh, healthy young volunteer men uh, in the 1940s, Ansel Keys and others did this study where they put uh, these volunteers on a low calorie diet uh, to mimic starvation, to study starvation, and their intake, their average intake was uh, 1,500 calories a day, and uh, they lost weight, and this weight curve has been of great interest to, to me and others because uh, it's got two components, a fast component and a slow component. You can write a mathematical model to describe it, and you can predict it very accurately with mathematical models that Kevin Hall and other people have developed. But at the end of it, basically at 24 weeks, that's what you look like when you eat a 1,500 calorie diet. And if you think about most weight control diets, 1,200, 1,500 calories, you don't see obese people looking like that when the diet's over. And so part of the reason for that is uh, people don't adhere very well. And uh, you can quantify this degree of adherence with these uh, thermodynamic models, you can, this is the uh, first law of thermodynamics, uh, energy input, energy output, and energy storage. And you can develop a, um, a thermodynamic model, and this has been done by uh, several people, Kevin Hall is one, Diana Thomas is another, and you can find this on the Pennington website, but you can dial in your weight, height, and age and uh, the amount of calories you want to reduce your intake by and you can predict uh, six months or 12 months later how much you should weigh. So for example the Minnesota experiment you can predict with great precision what that weight curve looks like today. Now what happens in reality in behavioral programs and there are thousands of studies that you could show look identical to this Unlike the Minnesota experiment, people lose weight. Uh, they lose it uh, often very quickly over a period of six months. And then almost universally, they regain the weight again. And uh, this regain can be shown in innumerable studies. This just happens to be Weight Watchers uh, study on the top, the uh, self-help group and the commercial weight uh, program being Weight Watchers, and the other being a uh, control group from a large uh, pharmacologic study basically always looks the same. And uh, that's led to the notion that behavioral management really is not very good at long-term weight maintenance. And so the question is what causes that phenomenon? Why is that there? 
but it also leads to the notion that more effective therapies beyond this are needed, perhaps pharmacologic measures. So that led to the notion, uh, not in sequence, of mother's little helper. Uh, you know, you clean the house with great vigor and you lose weight and look beautiful at the same time. What would do that other than amphetamines? <laughs> and so in the 1960s, that went uh, viral, literally, uh, millions of, millions of, at least hundreds of thousands of people uh, were uh, sold amphetamines. And amphetamines were discovered empirically uh, as a sympathomimetic agent, uh, stimulant. And uh, over the years, uh, of course, uh, amphetamines mimic uh, epinephrine. And you can show that. Here are some of the more common ones. Uh, that's amphetamine, phenylpropanolamine, and ephedrine all have the same structure as epinephrine. So when you take this drug, you're uh, taking a sympathomimetic and you uh, get the flight and flight reaction. You don't sit down to eat dinner when you're running away from a bear. And so that uh, triggers the sympathomimetic uh, state. And as a result, uh, all three of these have been banned by the FDA. Uh, 1971 for amphetamines because it had an off-target effect. It was addictive. Uh, it's, it's dopaminergic activity, and that leads to addiction. Uh, phenylpropanolamine, 2005, it's dexatrim. And dexatrim was banned because it caused hemorrhagic strokes in women. Uh, women were taking dexatrim over the counter. Uh, case control studies were done. Significant hemorrhagic strokes, because it raises blood pressure two or three millimeters of mercury, and you put that into a million people and you get strokes. And then finally, ephedrine, uh, Ma Wang, 2005, uh, wildly popular, metabolite, other agents. Uh, the adverse events were very substantial. Uh, I was very involved with the banning of uh, ephedrine and Ma Wang in 2004. Uh, with the tremendous popularity of those dietary supplements. So uh, all three of those have been banned and that whole class of drugs uh, is uh, largely defunct now. Uh, so these are what are called mechanism-related adverse effects. The mechanism of the drug causing appetite suppression is the same mechanism that causes the adverse event. So historically, uh, drugs have been developed largely empirically. So uh, one of the classics people talk about empirical drug development is heart failure, dropsy. Uh, one of the uh, obvious treatments, uh, this is called anasarca. It's massive edema with heart failure. And you trephine people. You punch a little hole there with a spout and the water drains out. Very primitive on the 15, 1600s, people had heart failure. And then uh, William Withering, 1785, I think you must know this story, uh, simply uh, observed very keenly that uh, foxglove uh, extracts led to marked resolution of anasarca, a resolution of heart failure. And of course, the active agent was digitalis, digoxin. And it took more than 200 years to figure out that digoxin works in sodium potassium ATPase, improves cardiac uh, contractility through calcium mechanisms, and heart failure is very substantially improved. That's empirical. Empirical because uh, Withering had no idea how it worked. It worked. He figured it out. He saw it. And so a lot of drugs we have, aspirin, purely empirical. That's not how drug development works today unless you're really lucky and you find something in the Amazon that does something, you work through discovering targets. And that's a whole paradigm change in drugs. And that will be a cornerstone of my presentation. But uh, I'm going to give you one more example uh, of uh, this uh, neural uh, network is deeply involved in regulation of food intake and energy expenditure. And I'll come back to that later. But um, this uh, network has uh, the key node is the melanocortin-4 receptor. 
and that regulates energy balance downstream through a number of mechanisms. So through activation of MC4, one of the uh, key receptors is the uh, 5-HT2C receptor, one of the serotonin receptors, 5-HT2C. And if you stimulate this, it'll uh, pass the impulse down and regulate energy balance and food intake through that. And uh, another empirically uh, discovered agent that acted on this was the serotonergic agonist fenfluramine that was discovered as a screening for antidepressants, serotonergic agonist, but it uh, had weak effects on regulating food intake through this mechanism that was actually only discovered fairly recently. People didn't know how it worked, but they did know that it uh, empirically caused food intake reduction, and it's a mixed uh, activity on not only the 5-HT2C, but the 5-HT2B. Now what that's called in a drug development is a non-selective agent. Uh, you, what you want is a drug that perfectly works on the receptor that you're interested in, and so if it's non-selective, that always carries a certain risk. And the risk in this case was totally unknown for 30 years that fenfluramine was on the market as a weight control agent. And that risk was that the aortic valve has 5-HT2B receptors on it. And when you gave large doses of fenfluramine with fentramine, fenfen, that non-selectivity caused the uh, overgrowth of the aortic valve. People got a aortic insufficiency heart failure and needed new heart valves. And of course, fenfluramine was taken off the market. But nevertheless, this shows the importance of selectivity of a drug and why off-target effects can be of such huge risk. And the obesity uh, pharmacologic field is littered with these kinds of bad stories. Uh, ephedrine, amphetamines, uh, fenfluramine, fentramine, all these drugs have ended up through largely empirical drug development is having these adverse events. And so that's cast a very uh, bad shadow on these kinds of agents. Now the modern era then uh, began actually very long time ago. This uh, notion, Hetherington and Ranson, 1940, uh, they uh, did lesioning experiments uh, in the hypothalamus. And uh, these are very pioneering work. Uh, often tremendously unappreciated, but uh, they found that the uh, lesions in the lateral hypothalamus and the ventromedial hypothalamus uh, caused uh, either uh, failure to eat, lack of hunger, or uh, failure to have satiety. And so it became recognized that the lateral uh, and ventromedial hypothalamus regulated uh, fasting and feeding. and. Uh, I put that up because I have two cats. Uh, one's thin, one's overweight, right? <laughs> Tongue my wife. But nevertheless, uh, they did it with mice and they did it with cats. And this very important idea sat there for a long, long time, 50 years or so, uh, that the brain controls feeding. And uh, that observation was really put into perspective beginning 1980s when uh, people began to study twins. And it was clear these are uh, non-identical twins, and these are identical twins. You don't have to look at many of them to know that uh, identical twins have closer weights and heights and everything else than non-identical twins. And so that difference between two types of twins, monozygotic and dizygotic, is called heritability. And you can show the heritabil heritability of BMI is about 70%. That's the R squared. And so 70% of between individual differences in BMI is heritable. And uh, many of the, this is a classic study, again, done by Mickey Stunkard, where he studied uh, identical twins uh, reared by their biological parents uh, or, and or by their adopted parents. Very hard to do this. This doesn't happen very often where twins are reared apart. And what he was able to show uh, was that the twins uh, reared apart resembled more their biological parents 
than their adoptive parents. So uh, even if you were raised in a different environment by different parents, your weight still resembled that of your uh, natural parents. And so this idea, and there were a number of studies around this time in the mid-1980s, showing again the strong inheritance of body weight and BMI. And then, of course, the, the real moment of truth came in uh, 1994 with the discovery of the mechanism of the OB mouse. The OB mouse on the left and its normal little mate on the right uh, discovered right in 1940s, 1950s in Bar Harbor at Jackson Lab. And uh, work had been done over time by uh, Doug Coleman and others at Jackson Lab where they did parabiotic experiments. They sutured those two mice together and uh, they found that, of course, the OB mice lost weight when sutured to the normal weight mouse, suggesting that there might be some hormonal uh, intermediate that led to body weight regulation. I'm simplifying a little bit, but uh, that general notion came 1994, uh, Jeff Friedman uh, and others at Rockefeller discovered that that hormone was leptin, uh, shown there in the middle, that's leptin, uh, a uh, small protein circulating in blood made by adipose tissue released into the circulation and having negative feedback signal on the brain where these uh, Hetherington and Ranson sites are in the hypothalamus uh, regulating energy intake and energy expenditure. So it's a negative feedback signal. Uh, if you have no leptin as in the OB mouse then uh, you eat out of control and uh, if you have a defective leptin receptor, you also eat out of control and your leptin levels are very high. So this really closed the loop then, showing that body weight is regulated through genetic mechanisms, through discrete hormonal pathways, and that was a revolutionary change in the field. Uh, of course, then you have to have proof of concept, and so, uh, what uh, Friedman and others uh, after him very quickly showed that if you make leptin synthetically, if you give it to the OB mouse uh, in very small amounts, it becomes normal body weight. It's called proof of concept. And so that then sealed this mechanism that body weight is regulated through both peripheral and central sites. The next uh, proof of concept came a little bit later uh, 1999, Faruqi and uh, uh, a number of other uh, investigators who work with them at Cambridge uh, found these uh, children referred to them as in that very first slide I showed, morbidly obese child, very early onset obesity. They found this child had zero circulating leptin and uh, this is a weight curve in that child. This is the normal uh, weight range uh, in children and this child was massively obese by the age of 10 and then when given leptin in daily injections promptly lost weight and uh, subsequently grew and uh, four years later essentially a, a normal person with daily leptin injections. And so I'm sure many of you are aware of this work but it's a beautiful proof of concept of a molecular mechanism and it uh, opened up many research possibilities. This is a very uh, recent one this year uh, I thought you'd be interested in. This is a massively obese child uh, showed up uh, with this uh, morbid obesity uh, at, at a very young age and this is a fascinating one because this child had very high circulating leptin levels and uh, they found that uh, this uh, child had a single transversion of G to T in uh, its uh, DNA and that led to a single change in one amino acid in leptin, aspartic to tyrosine and that made leptin inactive in the leptin receptor. So this child had zero leptin activity even though it had high circulating leptin levels. That child became normal weight when given leptin injections. Proof of concept. And then the uh, proof concept in adults came. These are three adults 
who uh, was discovered to have OB mutations, obesity mutations, no circulating leptin at adult ages. Uh, none of them had gone through puberty. And when they were given uh, physiological do doses of leptin, they became normal weight, uh, went through puberty. Uh, and uh, of course, we now know that leptin is linked not only to food intake and energy expenditure, but to pubertal development and a whole host of other mechanisms I will talk about later. So basically, uh, this slide just shows that uh, they had almost a million calories of stored energy in the beginning, and that dropped the factor of four or five over about a one-year period with leptin treatment. So the obvious thing was uh, we can cure uh, obesity in adults with leptin. Uh, so uh, the first study of that was uh, one, one that I participated in, in which obese adults were given uh, leptin injections. And they were given a dose range, and I, I won't go through the whole study, but the doses that they were given were so massive, unlike the OB mutant adults, uh, that it had to be infused through a pump over 24 hours because the volume was so large. But uh, even at the very, very highest dose of uh, leptin, the normal non-OB mutated adults only lost one or two kilograms with that drug. And as a result, it developed into this idea that if you don't have the OB mutation, you're one of those 20 people in the world who have that mutation, you have leptin resistance. Leptin resistance. And so leptin proved to be of non-value in garden variety obesity. So what underlies that? So, so I've been very interested in this. I'll give a brief uh, uh, idea of some of the thoughts I have about this. But leptin resistance is one thing. But one of the uh, important uh, discoveries, now that we know there's a neurohormonal axis regulating weight, is that if you take animals and you uh, feed them and then fast them and refeed them again, and you study these central hormonal mechanisms, what you see is that uh, when you fast an animal, uh, there's a whole cascade of uh, neural mechanisms that are activated that stimulate appetite and hunger uh, in an animal model. So in this case, this is neuropeptide Y. And neuropeptide Y is one of the most potent orexigenic compounds. If you inject that into a rat, a brain, you will see the animal eat voraciously. And so what you see when you fast an animal is the same thing. It stimulates uh, CNSNPY. The animal feels very hungry, as you would expect. And so there's this counter-regulation of fasting and feeding. And that's been shown for almost every CNS hormone related to uh, food intake, leptin, uh, neuropeptide, YMC4. All of them become activated when you fast the animal as a counter-regulatory mechanism. So it generated this idea that uh, this is a slide uh, Judy Corner made a number of years ago. But you have fat cells. They make leptin. And when the fat cells uh, become filled, you have enough fat, uh, leptin uh, sends out its signal, high leptin levels. Uh, to the hypothalamus. It stimulates this uh, regulatory pathway to uh, decrease your energy expenditure and uh, increase food intake. I'm, I should say when you fast, rather fast, decreases fat cells. It drops the leptin levels, counter-regulatory effect. And as a result, you increase food intake, decrease energy expenditure, and that restores your fat cell mass. So these counter-regulatory effects. So this is a very important idea. Okay, so counter-regulation. So now we come back to Stewart and behavior modification. Why does weight always come up after you lose weight, after six months or more? So it's not entirely clear, but the one study on this 
uh, published New England Journal, Sumithrin uh, et al. They uh, put people on a very low calorie diet for eight weeks, and that's the equivalent of a fast. Fasting, they lost a large amount of weight, uh, eight or ten kilograms. Uh, presumably, their CNS mechanisms now are saying, uh, you're starving, time to eat. And uh, they found that after they followed them for uh, more than a year, that their fasting level initially dropped, as you would expect, as a counter-regulatory mechanism. And then even out at week 62, leptin levels were still low. Uh, and they did a whole array of other uh, neurohormonal mechanisms, all suggesting that there's a set point. You go off that set point, you lose weight. Uh, those counter-regulatory mechanisms are making you want to eat more, exercise less, regain the weight back again. So this notion is out there. And that sets up the argument uh, for pharmacologic management. I'll just throw in that uh, exercise, at least extreme exercise, also is accompanied by counter-regulatory effects. So if you do uh, 500 calories a day of uh, exercise, that'd be a lot. Uh, you don't lose weight 500 calories because your food intake will go up to compensate. Not 100%, but it compensates. And uh, I'm going to give uh, one very practical example. This is Taft, 1905, our most obese president. Uh, he had a great diet. He lost 60 pounds. And he, quote, said in his letters, uh, even though people told him he looked good, he was continuously hungry. And so this idea that uh, you can lose weight from an obese state and you become the reduced obese, but something is churning away to make you relapse again. Not everyone may agree with that, but but uh, the data seem to support a good part of that story. So you can show that with this drug. This is uh, one of the first weight loss drugs of modern time, Orlistat. Uh, Orlistat is a lipase inhibitor. You take a pill before you eat your meal. Uh, it uh, inhibits gastrointestinal lipases. And if you take one pill with every meal, you'll lose 300 calories a day in your stool. Uh, get a little malabsorption, and so you're on a 300 calorie a day diet. And so that would predict that you would lose a fair amount of weight over time, 300 calories a day over time. And uh, this is just one example of a weight curve with Orlistat, one of the longest trials, 104 weeks. Uh, doesn't show up too well. This is placebo, this is active. And uh, there have been many studies of Orlistat, and this is a meta-analysis, and it shows that uh, at, uh, when you sum all these studies up, the mean weight loss for that 300 calorie deficit is just under three kilograms. And what would you expect for a 300 calorie deficit? Well, you can calculate this very accurately with these thermodynamic models. And what you find when you do the calculation is you should lose six kilograms, not three, six. And the reason is because when you lose fat in your stool, you counter-regulate. You're going to begin to eat a little bit more. It's very, very subtle. But experimentally, you can show that uh, when you uh, use Orlistat, that counter-regulatory mechanisms will slightly increase your intake. And so the deficit's not 100, uh, 300, it's 150 net deficit. So now that enters into this era then. We've now discovered that there are molecular mechanisms for weight control. And we don't believe in empirical uh, treatment anymore for all the reasons I mentioned. And so with the discovery of leptin, uh, we know that there's a uh, signal from fat to the central nervous system. But since then, many other signals have been discovered in the hypothalamus. 
And this is called the homeostatic mechanisms. And the hypothalamus regulate weight, body temperature, uh, energy expenditure, and so on. And uh, that loop then regulates body weight. So leptin's been ruled out now as a pharmacologic for uh, obesity, garden variety obesity. And so if you look at that map, and that map is around 1995, 6, 7, 8, all these discoveries were made. It's a ton of targets there. And so you can take those targets, you can make a drug that works on that target, and you can hit it very precisely uh, with an, a drug, uh, and then presumably activate that axis and lead to weight loss. So those are all the targets over there. Every one of them has been tried. And so I'm going to tell you the story about two of them that I worked on. OK, so neuropeptide Y. I already mentioned that it's a potent orexigenic agent in the brain. And uh, that's uh, neuropeptide Y on the left and the receptor on the right. And if you can make a drug that fits that receptor perfectly, blocks out NPY, you should lose weight should uh, work very well. And so uh, the proof uh, of this is that if you take the OB mouse, this is the leptin deficient mouse uh, in the uh, middle, that's the uh, normal litter mate on the left. And if you then knock out the NPY receptor, you can see you get an intermediate phenotype. phenotype. What that means is NPY is in the loop for leptin. And we now know that's the case. And so that's one proof of uh, mechanism. So uh, Merck saw that type of data. That's actually Merck data. And so they said, let's block NPY. Great target. And so <clears throat> what you do then is you take the NPY receptor, you put it in uh, some uh, media, and you send it out to New Jersey to the <clears throat> high throughput screening facility. You had the Merck Library of uh, Chemical Compounds, five million of them or something like that. You hook the two of them together. You wait three months, and you say, oh, these drugs seem to activate or inhibit the NPY receptor. Three months cost millions of dollars to do this. You find uh, candidate molecules, and then you give it to the organic chemists. They spent two or three years now perfecting that molecule till it fits the receptor perfectly, no off-target effects, doesn't uh, have adverse EKG effects, other effects, and you get a drug. That's the drug that came out, MK557. And uh, when you put it in mice, in the obese mouse model, uh, you get proof of concept because this shows that uh, this is the uh, placebo group. These are the active group. You get beautiful weight loss in the mouse. And you get proof of that this is mechanism related because then you make the knockout, NPY knockout, and you show that the drug has no effect in the knockout. If it has an effect in the knockout, that means there's an off-target effect, throw away the drug. So, this proved that this is a very selective, highly effective drug. So skipping about 10 steps then, uh, you uh, want to make sure when you give that drug to humans and you do the pharmacology, that when you give that drug, it gets into the brain to the NPY5 receptor. So the way you do that is you make another drug. Uh, you make an MK557 but then you put a PET label on it, a fluorinated compound, a couple of million dollars to make this drug. It takes one year to make this other drug that's radioactive. And then you, uh, there's the radioactive version, the uh, native version. And then you uh, get 10 subjects in Belgium where they do this work. You, <laughs> you, you give them no IRBs there, nothing. Uh, you, get, you give them uh, the drug, and you give them placebo, and you dose range, and you see that 
it, the drug gets into the brain, it completely blocks the brain NPY receptor, that's 100% occupancy at a very, very low dose, and that higher doses don't really have much effect on the receptor. And uh, as a result, you're certain that you not only have proof of concept in the animal model, but that you can knock that receptor out in a human. So then you do uh, phase two, this is called. Uh, you do phase two, 500 subjects, normal phase two. I don't know, it costs $20 million to do it. You do it in you know, 15 different countries. You get those 500 subjects. You have a little run-in period. You do 12 weeks of treatment. You have a hypothesis on how much weight loss, and weight loss is your primary endpoint, uh, and you do proof of mechanism in humans. So uh, this drug uh, met proof of concept because when we gave it to uh, these phase two subjects, they lost a significant amount of weight compared to placebo. It was about one to two kilograms in 12 weeks. And uh, people at Merck thought, wow, our stock options are going to be amazing after this. We're going to have a drug blockbuster. Because they made the math mistake that they put a ruler on this and they extrapolated linearly <laughs> for one year. And so they thought, oh wow, this is amazing. Totally safe drug, not a single adverse event knocked out the NPY receptor. And then they did the one-year phase three. Uh, 80 countries, $100 million study. And you know what? At 12 weeks, the weight loss stopped. It was a kilogram again in a year. And so it had inadequate efficacy to get approved. Uh, it was just 3% weight loss. And so there it was, two-week two efficacy. And then uh, they came up with the bright idea that, well, maybe we could get weight maintenance. We could improve weight maintenance because when you fast, NPY levels go up. And maybe we can block that counter-regulatory mechanism. Uh, just like in the uh, mouse model I showed earlier with fasting. So we put people on a very low calorie diet, 10 kilogram weight loss, activated their NPY, randomized them, gave them the drug or placebo, and it still gave a kilogram weight loss. It didn't matter because they all regained the weight again, just like you would predict. So uh, bottom line then, uh, instead of having this sort of weight maintenance beneficial effect, it just didn't work. So turns out NPY mechanisms must not be critical in weight control, human weight control. Works great in the mouse, but not in the human. So this is a first wake up call. This is a few hundred million dollars worth of work. Phase three, if you ever want extra drug, there's a lot of it available at Merck. <laughs> So then the second example I'm going to give, and this is kind of reaching the end of my talk. I mean, this seems so obvious today, right? Marijuana is approved in some states and so on. You smoke marijuana, uh, you feel hungry. So uh, 1990, the receptor for tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, which is a CB1, cannabinoid 1 receptor, was discovered. Here it is, 1990, and uh, that is called a target. You get a target, you get a receptor, you can put it into your high throughput screening factory, you can make a drug, and if you block that receptor, you should get the opposite of hunger. Uh, so you should get satiety. And so the CB1 receptor, sorry, CB1 receptor mainly uh, in the hippocampus, basal ganglia, other places. Not really the hedonic center. This is not the hedonic mechanisms. It's other mechanisms, but it's locate, they're located in the brain, and uh, they're CB2 receptors, which are not too relevant. And <clears throat> you can show, there's very simple proof of mechanisms we did at Merck, but if you give anandamide, which is natural tetrahydrocannabinol, it's your circulating CB1 agonist. 
uh, animals will eat and become obese if you give them an end. Uh, if you, uh, uh, I'm sorry, they'll lose weight. Uh, well, I'm sorry, if you give them an endomide, they'll uh, eat. And uh, you can show proof of mechanism by knocking out the CB1 receptor. And what you can show is that uh, when you knock out the CB1 receptor, the complete knockout or the partial knockout, that you get lower body weight and lower food intake. So in other words, blockade of the CB1 receptor should lead to lower body weight and lower food intake. So that's one proof of uh, mechanism. So Merck did the high throughput screening thing. They discovered this compound. Um, so 1990, the receptor was discovered. By the mid-1990s, Merck was actively looking at this already. We didn't know about the whole CNS mechanisms of CB1 receptors, but they had a good idea. And so they developed this drug, uh, very potent, hits the target, and they did tremendous amount of physical chemistry and showed that this is highly selective for the CB1 receptor in the brain uh, with this physical chemistry models. And they showed then, they got proof of concept when they put Taranabant in the uh, diet-induced obese model, uh, they showed that they could get progressive weight loss with higher doses of the CB1 uh, uh, agent. And uh, the dose that produced weight loss was about 30% of the CB1 receptor uh, occupancy, about 30%. So this is a critical number because they wanted to get 30% blockade of the receptor in humans uh, to achieve weight loss. And as you'll see, this was a big mistake uh, going down the line. But 30% how they did this pharmacologically. And they were able to show that uh, Taranabon uh, was very selective by doing the wild type uh, diet obese animal and the knockout. The drug did not work in the knockout model, uh, showing it's selective. And then uh, we did these PET studies another year to develop the uh, PET ligand. Ten more subjects in Belgium uh, showing that it got into the brain and that uh, when you got to a dose of 7.5 milligrams a day, that you got 30% receptor occupancy. It's very critical because then when it went into clinical trials, the dosing was a six milligram dose, a four milligram dose, and a two milligram dose to achieve this. So I'm uh, going to show this very quickly. We did proof of concept, a uh, single dose in an eating laboratory. Merck built an eating lab in Europe. Uh, they did uh, beautiful uh, eating st uh, feeding studies. They were able to show that a single dose of Taranabon, uh, you to get pharmacokinetics, you give, have to give higher doses, did uh, extremely well reduced food intake and increased energy expenditure, single dose. Very potent drug. Uh, now we're getting to the 500 subject uh, phase two study. Uh, they uh, did the 12 week paradigm. And uh, what they showed, here's the 12 week results. Uh, they showed that this is placebo, uh, two, four, and six milligram doses. Uh, at the six milligram dose, this would have been the most potent weight loss, uh, weight loss drug ever uh, developed with that level of weight loss at 12 weeks. Extremely potent, six milligrams a day. And even at two milligrams, there was significant weight loss. Very potent drug. And uh, when we looked at the uh, adverse events in these 500 subjects, what we saw was that um, anxiety was statistically significant, kind of borderline, increase in anxiety at the highest dose. And there looked like there was a depression signal, but it wasn't statistically significant. Small depression signal. And that led Merck to push on into phase three. 
So phase three is four or five hundred million dollar study. Uh, 80 countries, uh, 8,000 subjects, phase three. And the dosing was two, four, and six milligrams. And uh, we were a couple of months into it, and I got a call from the Data Safety Monitoring Committee saying, people on the six milligrams aren't feeling too good. They're getting a lot of depression. You better stop it. So we had to stop the six milligram dose, titrate everyone back, and uh, we got the uh, two and four milligrams beautiful efficacy still. Uh, but when you look at the uh, psychological effects, uh, what you see is that there's a signal at the uh, uh, highest dose, now four milligrams, and it was uh, significant or borderline significant. Now we're talking about thousands of subjects uh, in the uh, four milligram dose. And there's also a small but non-significant signal for suicidality on this drug. And then that caused Merck to say, OK, we'll salvage this. We'll go to two milligrams and one milligram. And so another year study, another $50 million or so, we did another phase three study at these lower doses, found nice weight loss at the two milligram dose. And then uh, when looked at the signals, even at the two milligram dose, there were still small behavioral signals. A uh, little bit of depression, a little bit of irrit irritability. And so now Merck had 8,000 subjects to analyze the data on. They sat down and they said, can we mark the two milligram dose? Can we separate out the uh, depression irritability from the weight loss at two milligrams? And when they developed these pharmacodynamic models, what they found was that no matter what the dose, you never separated the weight loss effect from the behavioral effect. The mood and the weight loss were one for one with this huge database. And uh, we had applied for the FDA for registration. And we were sitting on that waiting for a decision from the FDA. And the CEO got cold feet and he said, kill it. I don't want any drug that causes depression in people or suicidality. That was the end of the drug. So. Uh, it was uh, killed for that reason. And then if we go uh, forward in time, we now know that uh, marijuana, CB1 receptors, are in not the homeostatic mechanisms, but they're in the hedonic and higher areas in the nucleus accumbens and other places as the primary sites, and they affect mood. And uh, only indirectly do they work through the homeostatic mechanism to regulate body weight. So it's not surprising. And if we now know today, this is just one of many examples, uh, these homeostatic mechanisms all live down here in the hypothalamus, but then they're tied to endocrine responses, autonomic blood pressure responses, um, behavioral mood responses, and as a result, you hit any targets down here or over here that work through these mechanisms, something else happens. Your blood pressure goes up. You get depressed. And so it's very, very hard to pull apart these targets that regulate weight from other effects. And that's sort of the bottom line then of why it's so hard to develop weight loss drugs using this uh, target uh, Effect. So last slide uh, shows that 1990, that CB1 receptor was discovered. It took 10 years, almost a billion dollars for Taranabon. Um, Sanofi had Romanabont, another drug, a billion dollars there. And so these uh, kinds of effects have really scared drug companies from getting involved in this for good reason. And we still need to really understand these mechanisms much better. So uh, in the last slide, basically, there's a hope we're developing much better drugs, uh, different ideas. And I, I really want to end now and say that I'm so grateful to Clive McKay because 
he's uh, generated this fabulous idea about fasting and uh, aging and uh, longevity. And not only does that work interested for aging, but it impacts directly on obesity and weight control and these related mechanisms. And it's such a pleasure to have been given the privilege to give this uh, lecture. Thanks very much. A little bit long, but okay. So what sets the set point? You know, in some surgery, you yeah. try to cut the stomach. The set point can be changed. Right? Yeah. So, so that's a great, great thought. So, so with obesity surgery, you can get long-term weight loss and some kind of weight maintenance. So uh, the mechanisms there surely must uh, go beyond the anatomic restriction of food intake, right? Because uh, Others have worked with obese surgical patients here, but, but uh, they don't, uh, depending on the type of surgery, they don't get the same ravenous appetite that people do when they're uh, uh, starving. So there must be other metabolic mechanisms involved. Yes. So the, you, you mentioned uh, the NPY drive about uh, trying to maintain loss. Right. What yeah. about leptin? Yeah, I thought that uh, there is a, a, a Rosenblum has shown that that seems to be helpful in patients that have lost about 10% of the blood. Right. So, so what, what they did is uh, they, they showed that when you uh, weight loss 10%, uh, your leptin levels go down, uh, you metabolically adapt, you give a physiological dose of leptin, and that restores your metabolic state. But it, what it hasn't shown is it doesn't pr promote significant weight loss. Yeah, but I guess my point is, yeah. it's, it, it works, but it, and, you know, it seems to help. Yes. If you maintain that weight loss level, yes. and it's a mechanism to prevent the body from having to maintain weight loss. It's a great point. That's a great point. And in fact, I told you that NPY, you still can get a barrel of it for very inexpensive if you want it. but, but. Merck has that drug on their shelf, and they're waiting for an opportunity exactly like you're saying. So you're reminding me that uh, Merck went to the FDA after this and said, what if we use this drug for weight maintenance? And uh, the FDA said, we don't know what weight maintenance is. So there's no regulatory category for leptin as a weight maintainer, but I think given the changes in time now, maybe that's a time, something to think about. Is there interest in kind of shuffling pharmaceutical targets? Because you saw an effect up to 12 weeks, and yeah. then you see that some sort of potential homeostatic mechanism kind of compensates. Yeah. But if you were to mix up these drugs, I mean, patient compliance and all would be an issue, yeah. but is there any interest in that? Yeah. So people have tried various permutations of that. That, that doesn't seem to be so effective. I like that idea, though, that you could, they've tried like every other day or things like that. But not so much this idea maybe of six months. So that would be interesting. The other thing, of course, is combining two drugs that have opposing mechanisms. And there are several drugs now that are in the market that purport to do that. But they're not uh, really uh, target development drugs. So the last thing I showed was you can make a single drug, a peptide drug, that has three separate mechanisms of action. And so that's a lot of people think that if you hit two or three different related targets, that you might get better effects without so many side effects. Yeah. So there are other ways to lose weight, and then I was wondering if those kind of other ways, like exercising or yeah. just like other ways today, like come with those kind of emotional changes too, or it only happens when it's done by drugs? No, I think, uh, well, I think there's a little debate, and I, I, I know my colleagues who have spent many years in, uh, helping people lose weight find that people have lost weight over time and keep it off, lose a lot of weight, still have many of those same sort of uh, responses. They feel hungry. Others can help me out here. But so those don't always go away, but they learn ways of adapting to those and having sort of uh, other uh, compensatory mechanisms. So I, I, I'm not sure I've always seen that in the patients I've worked with, but if you look at these uh, uh, people who have kept weight, there's the weight loss registry, it's called. Many of them have those uh, senses that uh, they still always feel hungry. Uh, I just saw a little thing about Jeb Bush uh, 
wanting to lose weight. He's on a diet. He's lost a lot of weight. And he said the same exact thing as Taft, if you look at the New York Times a few days ago. He said, yeah, I look great, but I feel hungry all the time. So I, I think those responses, personally, I, I think there's maybe some of those are hardwired, but I'm not sure. But I don't think they completely disappear. We could debate it, but I think it's worthy of a hypothesis. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> this is like an extremely interesting story to tell, or the biological system. Yeah. But how do they explain the fact that if you look at rates of obesity, yeah. there was a marked change that happened in the 1980s. Yeah. Yeah. So, or, so or are we talking about different things when we talk about what's causing the increase in the prevalence of obesity yeah. versus how do we get people to lose weight and maintain it? I think the latter is more or less what I've dwelled on. But I think that, you know, again, I'm a layman in some of these areas, but I think preventing obesity is really where it's worth focusing. Because once it's set in, you know how hard it is to lose weight and keep it off. I mean, we're all trying different things, but preventing weight gain, like we talked about earlier today, is cer certainly one of them. But I, I have a sense that maybe early in development, there's some hardwiring that goes on, epigenetic effects or early development. Uh, I, we talked earlier a little bit about how language, you know, you learn to speak English, you know, when you're young, and then you try and learn to speak Chinese. Very difficult. And so certain things become wired uh, and, and very hard to change. And so I, I don't think we've explored too much in those areas yet. Mm -hmm. But is there any evidence that that hardwiring is in the adult stem cells, and you just have to wait until you get new populations that then repopulate right. the organ to have those other things go? I think back. it's a great idea. And I think, you know, one of the hard things, humans are so hard to study. And you have to study <laughs> them so long, and you need such big samples, as you saw from my presentation. But, but I mean, the data is so sparse on long-term really excellent follow-up of people, like the uh, Sumithrin paper I showed, where they looked at these counter-regulatory hormones in a year. This is the only paper I know of that has really looked at this. There have been a few others in modern times. But try following a sample for a year or more with really intensive metabolics, very difficult, very expensive. So you, testing your hypothesis would take a little work. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, God. <laughs> what about women and pregnancy? Women gain a lot of weight during pregnancy, and then we reset. But are we more so, susceptible? Great to? question. I know there are real experts in the room. But I, but I would say that whatever the mechanisms are, reverse uh, postpartum. Is that true? Uh, that whatever stimulates the increase in food intake, Right, there's an increase in that. That's very fascinating in itself, but that those mechanisms must, uh, am I right? Help, help me out. Is that right, Kathy? Yeah, yeah postpartum. The model cascade that goes with directing that weight gain in pregnancy and immediately postpartum, it's all turned off. Yeah. So you have the chance to lose it if you uh, work that combination of breastfeeding and exercise. So I do have a question. So I have a question. Once you've had a pregnancy and you've created the state, is it completely reversible to the sense that you're same after? So you can lose weight, keep it off, and do all the same things before and after. You could, but then there's um, the state of um, having small children in the house. And right. That right. Is the <laughs> right. The change of lifestyle. Yeah. Those of you who are wondering who asked that question. That's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> For every great man, there's a woman who's really surprised. Yeah. <laughs> surprised. Yeah. I've been waiting on that one. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you. 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 Thank you.